Greetings and welcome. We are in 303 and we turn now back to Craig Conrad's Unstoppable Volume Lesson 29. I hope that you are in your journals as well. Let's go ahead and jot down our focus concept really quickly. A very unstoppable kind of idea. Write it down. Uh, where you are isn't as important as where you are going. It's a very interesting idea and I would write it down. Where you are isn't as important as where you are going, right? Let's take a look now at lesson 29 called Stoppable. Several have called this maybe the most tragic chapter out of the entire volume. No question, the story we are about to read had a prodigious influence on the life of Craig Conrad and the writing of the Unstoppable volume and all of the many, many students that he has met during his Unstoppable uh, meetings. Let's take a look. If I had to list I hope you're reading with me on page 95. If I had to list the names of the top 10 students I've taught, Clint Haskins would definitely be on that list. He was reared by honest, hardworking, ranching parents from Maybell, Colorado. They instilled some old-fashioned values in Clint, the kind of values missing from too many kids these days. Clint would always respond to my questions with, Yes, sir, Mr. Conrad. The kids called him a rancher, but Clint was more than that. He was a football player, wrestler, homecoming royalty, member of the rodeo team. Clint Haskins was the All-American boy. That's why I was shocked and stunned when I heard that he was involved in the worst traffic accident in Wyoming history. One day, during Clint's freshman year, the electric garage door to my wood shop failed to close completely. The door remained open all night. The next morning, it was very evident we had a visitor, a skunk. The door was fixed that morning, and I figured our problem was over. I was wrong. Over the next few days, the smell seemed to intensify. Finally, it became unbearable. The smell was coming from the plywood storage area. I had my students form a fire line to remove the wood and find the skunk. I needed somebody to be first in line. Clint immediately volunteered. After several minutes of handling, of handling wood back to his classmates, I heard Clint yell, I see it, I see it. He screamed as he came charging out of the plywood room. All of his other classmates scattered, running for their lives. We closed the door, called the animal control officer to remove the skunk. She arrived with a 10-foot rod, hypodermic needle on one end. The skunk was about to get a lethal injection when the officer just started laughing. The skunk's already dead, she said. The whole class busted up laughing, pointing at Clint, and I nicknamed him Sir Skunky. When my son... Colton was in second grade. He thought he wanted to be a cowboy. Clint was a junior in high school when he volunteered to teach Colton how to rope. What a sight the two of them were together in their cowboy hats. Colton barely stood waist high next to Clint, even with his cowboy hat on. Clint showed him how to throw a lasso at a fake steer head stuck into a bale of hay. Colton thought the time they spent roping was the coolest thing on earth. During Clint's senior year, he volunteered to be an elf at our annual Christmas event called Santa's Workshop. Clint and his classmates spent two months building wooden toys for needy children in our town. The night of the big event, the children were invited up to our shop, which had been decorated like the North Pole. Santa and, Ma and Mrs. Claus were there. The choir sang Christmas carols. There were cookies, punch for the little kids. We even broke open a couple of piñatas. Next, it was time for my students, who were dressed like elves, to give away the wooden toys they'd made. Clint's toy caused a huge commotion that night. He'd made a rocking motorcycle and had his friend custom airbrush designs with flames all over it. Well, every little kid wanted that motorcycle, even the girls. No one wanted the painted ponies, the scooter airplanes, the rocking llamas. They all wanted Clint's motorcycle. One father requested his son get the motorcycle because he had named him Harley after the Harley Davidson motorcycle. I don't remember the name of the little kid that got Clint's motorcycle, but I'll never forget how happy he was. That little kid was the envy of every kid at Santa's workshop. After the final Friday story, Clint's senior year, I issued his class the five-year challenge. This is traditional for Mr. Conrad with the students that he taught. He called it his five-year challenge, and he gave it to every senior class that he, that he taught. Take a look at it. I didn't want to see them, any of them, for five years. I did this at the end of the school year as a way to force my students to look forward and not look back on the good old days. Now it's time to go out and accomplish something in the real world, I challenged. Come back in five years and brag about what you've done. Clint took this to heart. I didn't see him for nearly four years. Occasionally I'd see his mom Lynn around town. Clint hasn't forgotten your challenge, she'd say each time. He's going to come and see you when the five-year challenge is over. 
Tragically, I would see Clint before the five years was up. The next time I saw him, he was dressed in an orange jumpsuit with his legs shackled together and his arms chained to his waist. He was being led by the police officer into an Albany County courtroom. Clint was the sole survivor of the worst traffic accident in the history of Wyoming. He was accused of causing a head-on drunken driving collision that killed eight fellow student-athletes from the University of Wyoming. With two-thirds of the cross-country team gone, the university had to cancel the rest of the meets for the season. Still wearing the scars of the accident, Clint walked past me in the hallway outside the courtroom. I was about to walk into that same courtroom and face the families of the eight dead University of Wyoming cross-country student-athletes. This would be the hardest thing I ever had to do in my entire life. I could hear many of the family members sobbing as soon as I entered the courtroom. Clint's family was sobbing, too. This was Clint's bond hearing, and I was asked by his lawyer to speak on Clint's behalf. On the night of September 16th, just five days after the 9-11 tragedy, Clint Haskins drove his one-ton pickup truck from Laramie, Wyoming to Fort Collins, Colorado. Clint had been drinking that night following a phone call with his girlfriend. He headed south to see her on Highway 287, one of the deadliest roadways in the country. Near the six-building town called Thai Siding, police reports stated Clint crossed the yellow line. The time was 1.30 a.m. Heading north on the same highway was a Jeep Wagoneer crammed with the eight University of Wyoming cross-country runners. The two vehicles met head-on. Clint's blood alcohol level was .16. The legal limit is .10. As I took the stand in the courtroom, I was wondering what was going through the minds of the eight families. They'd all experienced unbelievable grief and loss. Now, I was going to speak about the character of the person they all believed killed their sons. To say I was nervous was an understatement. Clint's attorney questioned me first. I was asked to relate things about Clint's character. Since he was my student for four years, I had many good things to say. When I spoke about Clint and the Santa's workshop, Clint started crying uncontrollably. So was everybody else in the courtroom. When I finished, the prosecuting attorney asked, did you know Clint had a drinking problem, Mr. Conner? I remembered Clint made a comment to be unstoppable, drug and alcohol free after hearing Don Smith's phone call when Clint was a freshman. He shook my hand at the conclusion of the Unstoppable You program. I told the court I was not aware of a drinking problem with Clint. At that moment, the prosecuting attorney showed evidence of a drinking problem. He told how Clint was arrested three times as an MIP, a minor in possession. Their attorney went on to say, after both occasions, Mr. Haskin continued to drink after his arrest, and now eight people are dead, end quote. Afterward, the district judge slapped the gavel down and said, bond is set for a hundred thousand dollars. Clint was let out of the courtroom and back into jail. I could hear his chains dragging along the floor as he left, mixed in with the sounds of many different people crying. The drive back home was two and a half hours long. The whole way, I kept thinking, what a tragedy it was for everyone involved. Had Clint not been drinking that night, the consequences would have been totally different. Now alcohol, once again, would make someone stoppable. In this case, the nine young men became stoppable. Someday I thought Clint would get a second chance. Sadly, the eight cross-country kids never would. I knew I would never forget the sight and sound of seeing one of my former students in chains. Clint had become stoppable. Since the judge set a cash bond of $100,000, his family would have to pay the entire amount for Clint to be free until his trial. Usually it's just a percentage, but not this time. $100,000 is a lot of cash, and I knew Dale and Len Haskins would be hard-pressed to come up with it. That'd be hard for anyone. I figured I probably wouldn't see Clint again until the day he appeared at my classroom door like an apparition. The comment here, of course, is alcohol doesn't discriminate when stopping the unstoppable you. Uh, I've often made this observation. You know, sometimes students will say, I've never had an MIP. Well, let's make sure we understand. MIP just means minor in possession. There's two kinds of MIP. The ones where you have it, and the ones where you're caught. But either way, you're a minor in possession. You're a minor in possession. If you are breaking the law with alcohol and drugs, 
You're a minor in possession. It's just a question of whether you get caught. Of course, you can get caught by being pulled over, or you can get caught by surviving an accident. Powerful image. The sound of the chains dragging along the floor. Let's make a couple of quick observations in our journals here really quickly. In life sometimes, let's just say it out loud. If we can learn anything from this story, we can learn this. In life sometimes, there are no take-backs. Sometimes in life, there are take-backs. And you get to go, I'm really sorry, I jacked it up, I apologize, please forgive. Other times in life, no, no take-backs. And for the rest of one's life, and for the rest of a lot of other people's lives, for example, what happened with young Clint Haskins, no take-backs. Number two. Think about this five-year challenge. I think it's a good one for seniors to, to think about. We often do have the tendency, whoa, I'm just focused on graduation, man. I just want to get out of here and graduate. I believe that Mr. Conrad's challenge is a good one. What are you going to do in the first five years out of high school? Make a, make a challenge to yourself that you will do something important, something great, something, as Craig Conrad calls it, unstoppable, something that can define, then, the years that follow those five years. Number three, of course, really the true challenge here is to remain drug and alcohol free so you can be a true success. This is an interesting question. We'll finish with this one. What is the greatest struggle in your time at Royal High School that you've had to overcome? You'll be writing on this one in your journal, and I think it's a, I think it's a good one. Journal entry number 29 for lesson 29. What is the greatest struggle that you had to overcome? How did you overcome it? And how will you look to overcome other challenges coming in the future? Well, there you go, the tragic story, lesson 29. Thank you.